to get out of the house. You don't have to travel and, and all that kind of stuff. So they, they tied their values and their passions with um, yoga in particular to um, what consumers would be needing, especially given uh, social distancing and shutdown uh, stay at home orders. Um, May 7th and then followed by May 13th, more information really getting, getting into their, their purpose for uh, providing yoga instruction, less stress, feel better, use movement, you know, kind of uh, combat the blahs as it were. And so we think Yoga Project uh, provided, pro provides an interesting example of how to use at least a platform to identify and communicate those values and connect with your patrons in a way and, and adjust on the fly as needed to, to really, you know, make that impact. How does that connect or how might that connect with how things have emerged in terms of essential businesses and essential products? Well, the government defined essential business as supplying or delivering food, medicine, healthcare, shelter, information, transportation, or insurance. And if you didn't fit neatly into that category, you were non-essential and had some difficulty uh, staying in operation. Except there kind of emerged a market definition that focused on especially entertainment and exercise, but also home goods. And some of this is rooted in the uh, information uh, defined in the government's definition, because that information being uh, kind of the backbone uh, developed from the internet. So you had these two different definitions, uh, one more stated, a little, one a little less uh, explicit. And if we think about how the, the government definition uh, evolved, uh, it really devolved out of uh, the, the social distancing uh, issue. Uh, we can't uh, really deliver some of these essential business uh, goods and services without some sort of risk in interaction. And so uh, the six feet, the, the protective uh, personal equipment, uh, things of that sort seems to have accommodated at least in part the, the, the social distancing aspect. Uh, the market definition seemed to have, mer have emerged from the stay at home orders. Once people were at home, uh, especially to combat you know, mental and physical issues from being locked in or not being able to travel, um, uh, the entertainment and the exercise in particular seems to have emerged from that in particular. And so the yoga project, did they neatly fall into essential businesses defined by government? No, but they seem to have found a place based on this loose market definition. And they focused again on movement, health, and stress reduction. And so they kind of connected the value driven purpose and the essential product definition into a, a thing that, that helped propel them forward. Next, if we think about flexible branding and, and URL SEO considerations, you know, a brand, as we mentioned before, is a very valuable business as asset and has the flexibility to, uh, or needs to have the flexibility to adapt and grow. And if we think about brand, your brand might be defined as how people feel about you in relation to what you do and what you say. And even more particularly, if you think about Simon Sinek's Golden Circle, why do you do what you do? How does that drive how you do it? And then ultimately, what you do in the process and how you communicate that. So that might be a, a way to conceptualize your brand and why it connects to purpose, uh, figuring out your why, your purpose, and driving what you do and what you say. We think this is necessary uh, for several reasons, but in particular, adopting a flexible brand that's appropriate to your value product relationship and for simplicity purposes. And who benefits? You benefit because you develop something that is valuable and is an asset. Consumers benefit because they have something reliable and dependable. And retailers benefit, uh, ultimately, if we get back to um, especially live transactions, retailers benefit by um, providing a, a venue for the transaction between you as the supplier and, and the consumer as the buyer. Now, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to talk about uh, trademark, trade dress, and some other interesting issues. Good morning. I hope everyone's doing well. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, participate in this. want to 
mirror what, uh, what Owen mentioned earlier. It's going to transition, I'm calling it a transition, but hopefully it'll be more of, uh, of a dovetailing than a, a true transition, and talk about trade dress. Um, as, as Owen mentioned earlier, when we talk about trademark, service mark, which we won't really get into the subtle distinctions between those two for all intents and purposes, trademark uh, applies to good, tangible goods, service marks apply to intangible services. Um, but trademarks and, and service marks, they, they protect a word, a symbol, a design, phrase, those types of things. That, and basically it, the protection is there um, to the extent that it identifies the source of those goods or, service, or services. So trademarks and services really serve uh, at, at their core as uh, source identification. Trade dress is a kind of a species, a unique species of, of trademark law. Um, kind of a, a textbook definition, I guess, of, of uh, trade dress is that it's a, it's a type of trademark that refers to the commercial look, commercial feel of a product or service or location, particularly in, in retailing, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about retail here in a, a slide or two, that identifies um, you know, the, the source of the product service or so that you can you know, determine, yes, this is the retailer that I want to, uh, uh, to do business with. But it really goes, it goes beyond that, and, as we'll see uh, in, in a slide or two. But uh, trade dress is just a, a fascinating area to me uh, of, uh, of trademark law because it goes so much further than, than a, single, uh, a single mark or even a portfolio of marks. Uh, it, it's more of a holistic approach uh, to a business. Um, but at any rate, when we just moving, uh, moving forward, when we talk about trade dress, as you can see, uh, the bottle here, uh, everything from the color, the shape, the design, the texture, uh, the other non-functional aspects that identify, um, just non-functional, just to kind of give you an idea. If let's assume that this bottle, um, you know, contains some type of liquid, okay? Functionally, yes, it's a bottle that contains that, but it could just as easily have been a can. It could just as easily have been made of plastic, but there's something, you know, the way that, that this bottle appears uh, to consumers, that's part of the trade dress. So again, it emphasizes identification and, and the building of that brand through the look and feel. So I always like to use this example uh, in class. Uh, and yes, I, I have a number of things covered up here uh, and I know everyone's muted, so I, I won't ask you to answer, but I dare say that most of you probably, even with the signage covered here, could tell me what this uh, establishment is, okay? Um, again, even, even with it covered. So uh, again, bad picture, but, but uh, you can see there, hopefully it's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, okay? Even though this particular, you have a hard time finding this particular style of, of Kentucky Fried Chicken retail location. You know, the, the red and white striping hasn't changed. Uh, the, the iconic bucket with Colonel Sanders on there hasn't changed. Uh, in fact, in, in the newer uh, Kentucky Fried Chickens, uh, they, they have incorporated the bucket look uh, into their lighting fixtures. So uh, it, it's a, you know, a consistent trade dress that is, has come down through the years. So one of the reasons that I think I love uh, trade dress is just the, the uh, amount of information that it almost immediately, if not immediately, conveys. Uh, it, it, it really is an interesting area of, uh, of intellectual property and, and, again, particularly trademark law in that it's, it's this interesting convergence of marketing, psychology, and intellectual property. Um, when we look at, at trade dress, and again, we're talking about properly managed, properly developed trade dress, it, it's very, very uh, easily, uh, or, or it's, it's something that, that when we look at it, it makes us, as consumers, it makes us feel a certain way. We either gravitate toward it or uh, in, in a bad situation, we're repelled against it. But whatever the reason, it helps us to identify that source uh, in a much more meaningful way than just a single uh, trademark or even a, a, a portfolio of trademarks or service marks. The reason that we're talking about trades uh, or trade dress uh, today, though, uh, in this context of, of uh, how we move from a, a physical or a, a primarily physical business world into, uh, again, whether it's temporarily or 
most likely somewhat permanent uh, online world, at least to, to some degree in, in most businesses, is the fact that, that trade dress perhaps more easily and more effectively when managed correctly and, and, and advisedly uh, can translate very, very easily from the physical world over in from the brick and mortar world, if you will, over into the online world. Um, and in fact, uh, this, this really isn't anything new to 2020. Businesses that have, have understood this, you know, if you look at, at a business's brick and mortar location, uh, assuming we're talking about retail, and you, you look at their online presence, one is going to really, um, uh, you know, reinforce the other. And that's something that, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about here, going back and looking at, at uh, the yoga project here, uh, that's something that um, uh, businesses that get it, they are really able to, to make that transition, uh, in my opinion, a lot, a lot smoother than, than those that don't understand that. So when we talk about trade dress, um, you know, trade dress, again, can apply to, to everything from the actual item to the business, uh, uh, you know, to services. So just kind of the quintessential example of, of a, a packaging, uh, you know, for products is the, the Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, particularly when we got into this era right here, that bottle shape has, um, has absolutely, um, uh, persevered and, and, and lasted to this day. So that if you looked at this bottle in isolation right here, even without Coca-Cola, most of you could probably say that's a Coca-Cola bottle, okay? Um, to, in, in kind of the more modern age, even the, out, the, uh, the layout from you know, the home screen on an Apple iPhone or you know, a Samsung product, they have a very unique, uh, you know, very, uh, each has, has its own unique feel to it. Smells, uh, believe it or not, smells can actually qualify for trademark protection. They can also be a big part of uh, trade dress. Everyone, like it or hate it, could probably, uh, you know, the oval factory kicks in and you can remember that Play-Doh smell from your childhood. Uh, as a matter of fact, my office building uh, in, in Nashville, the, uh, <laughs> the owner of the building, they pump in a scent in the uh, lobby area. Um, and uh, it, it really uh, it is part of the whole trade dress for that building. Um, products, again, packaging, Toblerone, uh, this is kind of a, a chicken or the egg. You know, did the, did the, is the trade dress the product itself, which is this pyramid-shaped chocolate, or is it pyramid-shaped chocolate that fits inside the packaging, and the packaging is the trade dress? Well, the answer is both are, okay, both working in, in sync. So basically, that's, that's trade dress in a nutshell. When we talk about brick and mortar, uh, we obviously are looking not only at the exterior arrangement of brick and mortar retail, we're also looking at the interior arrangement. And, and usually there's gonna be, we're gonna try to have some type of sync. And then I'm gonna bring Owen back in and we're both gonna kind of talk about moving from you know, talking about the trade dress area in terms of brand consistency across all platforms, uh, not only all platforms um, online, but also in the in the physical world. And uh, we'll, we'll try to do this as quickly as possible because we're starting to run up against uh, our time allotment. We want to leave plenty of time for Q and A. Obviously, you want to try to have brand consistency across all platforms, whether that's uh, in person in a brick and mortar situation on your. Uh, specific domain uh, and URL and within the internet uh, uh, less proper social media and marketplaces and we think about or evaluate yoga project uh, we see the the domain name that they chose was yogaproject.com and they, they kind of use the same uh, visual branding but you'll notice that in in places They've got Yoga Project Studios, but also in their YouTube channel, the Yoga Project Net. So in some ways, they're, they're doing things pretty well, but there's also some inconsistencies, and that can create issues for um, the, the algorithms that uh, dictate whether your search engine optimization is optimized or not. Uh, and so, not as consistent as desired. We as counselors would encourage them to um, 
go back and tinker with some of these things. Obviously it increases the work and the headache, but it would improve your SEO. If you're a new business, you would want to be thinking about these from the get go. Yeah. I, ideally these are things that you should really address, you know, when, when you are developing your market rather than on the tail end trying to clean it up. Cause sometimes it's just not possible. If we think about other e-commerce platforms outside of your own standalone uh, your URL and website and how branding and trademark fits into this and connects back to your purpose. What are the consequences of not having a registered trademark thinking about this on kind of the uh, end of our discussion, uh, a legal trademark, a registered trademark? Well, if you're wanting to platform on Amazon, you're not going to be able to do it. Amazon is so large. They're obviously the world's largest retailer at this point. They've become so large that intellectual property disputes are a headache to them. So to remove that administrative burden, they require that you have a registered trademark. And that's for the purpose of if you have a registered trademark and someone tries to use your trademark without authorization, they can quickly dispatch with it because they can point to they have a registration. Now that's not binding in court, of course, but administratively that takes a burden off of them. So not having a registered trademark uh, and if you have a goal for getting on Amazon, wanting to get a registered trademark should be of some import. Does not having a, a registered trademark uh, harm you in other ways? Well, it doesn't prevent you from platforming on things like Shopify, Etsy, and eBay if you have tangible goods. It doesn't prevent you from, uh, from a service standpoint, uh, platforming on Fiverr, of course but you lose out, you can platform, but you lose out on any kind of uh, um, uh, easy trademark resolution. If someone is using uh, you know, your, your common law trademark, but not registered trademark. Instead, you'll have to rely on the courts and litigation. And if you're willing to take that risk and, and run that much of an expense on the back end, you might as well take that money and invest it on the front end. You'll be better off for it. And if we think about trademark registration um, issues, especially clearance and uh, in light of Yoga Project, and I'll let Kevin discuss this a little bit more, Yoga Project's got some potential issues that uh, they might have to resolve now in order to get that registration. Yeah, and it, it kind of goes beyond, uh, this is outside the, the, the scope of, of today's discussion, but you know, there, there are a number of reasons that you, uh, you know, want to conduct uh, or should conduct a, a proper clearance. It's not only, uh, you know, the, the, the low-hanging fruit uh, is that uh, obviously you want to make sure that the mark, uh, you know, is available. And, and kind of the, the, the backside of that is you also want to make sure um, that it's not butting up against somebody else's market and you're going to potentially be sued for infringement. But the bigger part of it, and this is something that a lot of businesses don't understand, is, you know, a mark is only as good as it is protectable. And if you're in a situation where, just as you, know, you can see here, there are a lot of, of, of these marks that are registered with the Patent and Trademark Office that include yoga and project as uh, literal elements. There, if you have so many marks that have that same, those same literal elements, it's gonna be very difficult you know, to protect them. So the good news is you may not have a hard time getting that mark. The bad news is if you ever have to stop anyone else from getting that mark, uh, or, or using that mark, you're probably going to have a much harder time because it's a weaker mark. This is a, a very abbreviated uh, or, or about as brief a, a um, uh, clearance as you would ever do. When, when Owen and I uh, or, or any uh, trademark lawyers conduct a clearance, we do a knockout search to make sure uh, you know, that we're not going to find marks that are in use that are real obvious. If you come to me and say, I want to start a soft drink company and call it Coca-Cola, I better find that during my knockout search. And then beyond that, um, you know, we go into a much deeper dive looking at, at state uh, trade name registrations, company registrations, uh, DNB databases, uh, just a lot of different types of directories. So, and this is again all on the front end. So to kind of wrap up, and we know that everybody is drinking from a fire hose, we're, we're sort of pounding through a lot of information very quickly. But from a, whether you're a startup, uh, a, a newly established business or an existing business, evaluating or reevaluating uh, re your purpose and connecting it to the products and then your consumers that want those products is a very valuable way to 
um, secure or at least develop a unique brand that hopefully will transition to, into a unique trademark, giving you the flexibility and the simplicity that will help you with SEO optimization and driving those choices that hopefully on the back end will make registration a little bit easier to manage. Um, and with that, we will call it a session and open it up for questions. Thanks, Owen and Kevin, for a wonderful and very insightful presentation. We all learned a lot today. I'll now read some of the questions that were posted during the event and some that arrived by email before the event. The first question is, what type of technique would you recommend for developing a unique trademark? It's a really interesting question. There's no one surefire way to do it. Um, and we could probably spend uh, hours talking about this. From the standpoint of developing uh, trademarks uh, and branding more uh, all encompassing, you want to shoot for word mark development over design elements. Word mark elements or word marks give you broader protection. One of the, the techniques I like to use is essentially developing a list of, of words and attributes that might go into the products and or services that you provide. And then looking at uh, taking those uh, combination of words and, and squeezing them together to make compound words, something like a Microsoft. Microsoft uh, at its core stands for microprocessing software. And when they first started, they decided to kind of take these syllables of two different words and put them together. And that creates um, at least the, the opportunity for a recognizable, distinguishable, and registrable, uh, a defensible trademark. Um, Kevin, you want to? Yeah, I think that's good. I, you know, one thing that we didn't get the chance, or this question would be a lot easier to, to, to answer probably if we had been able to talk about trademark strength. There, uh, there's a, and I won't bore you with that right now, but there's, uh, there's a, uh, not, not all trademarks are, are created equal, uh, is probably a good way to look at it. You have uh, some marks that are very strong marks. They, uh, you know, are readily recognizable, uh, equally critical. They are easily defensible and protectable. On the other end of the, of the, uh, of the, of the sphere, you have, um, you know, marks that are just utterly generic, totally incapable of, of being registered or being protected. Uh, kind of the quintessential uh, issue um, with, um, sorry, getting, my, getting the video back up here, uh, kind of a, the quintessential example, rather, of, of a strong, strong mark would be Exxon. Uh, Exxon is what we, we would call a fanciful mark. It's a totally coined mark. Exxon, Kodak, those words mean nothing, uh, you know, in and of themselves. Uh, the, the owners spent a lot of money to develop those, those totally coined marks. On the other end of the spectrum, we have words um, uh, like, like aspirin, which I'll give you the short history lesson. That used to actually be a protected mark until it was allowed to fall into the generic sphere. But in, in between those two extremes, you have, uh, you know, just a wide range. So it, a lot of times, uh, and I promise I'm coming to a point here, a lot of times businesses um, will automatically jump at terms that describe what it is that they do because they think, well, if people are looking, if consumers are looking for this type of good or service, what better mark than one that says what, it, you know, that is descriptive. The problem is descriptive marks are very weak. And if it's a descriptive mark that hasn't, uh, you know, that, that, that is too weak, it's, uh, it's not going to even be uh, registrable. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that Owen, I'm sure he's dealt with more office or as many office actions as I have where um, you get a, uh, uh, an application kicked back to you because they call it merely descriptive. It's merely describing what it is that you're doing. Uh, what, we have to do then if, uh, is try to convince the, the uh, examining attorney at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that no, it's not really descriptive. At most, it is suggestive 
of what we do. Sometimes we can, you know, we're successful, sometimes we're not. But the bottom line is, if you're a business, I always like suggestive marks, ones that when you, when you hear it, you think, I think I know what they do. And it kind of prods you to investigate further. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love for all my clients to come up with, uh, you know, the Exxons and the Kodaks of the world because they're very easy to register, uh, easy to protect. But just as a practical, uh, uh, you know, practical consideration, I, I really like um, suggestive marks because they're on the stronger end of suggestive marks. And to piggyback on Kevin's point about the, the merely descriptive uh, rejection, that doesn't completely close the door on registering that trademark. One of the things that we tend to end up doing, especially if we can't convince the client to change uh, the direction of that mark, is if it's sufficiently distinguishable, but not uh, uh, suggestive, we can register it on the supplemental register. And after five years, you can move it up to what's called the principal register, the main register. The, the issue there is there's a cost involved in that. There's a marketing cost, a practical cost. You have to spend the next five years pumping marketing dollars into a mark so that you can overcome that merely descriptive and move it into what's called now acquired distinctiveness. If you're going to spend that amount of money from the marketing standpoint, you should spend it on the front end developing a mark that's at least suggestive uh, and or arbitrary out of the gate, if not coining a, a new term altogether. So those are some of the, the, the practical considerations that go into thinking about technique for developing uh, brands and or trademarks. Dr. Langton? Okay, great. That was a lot of good information. There is another question from the audience, which is how do you measure brand value? That's an excellent question. Is there a CPA in the house? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never put either patents or trademarks through a proper valuation. Um, most businesses that I've dealt with um, are not uh, looking to, uh, like the, the Coca-Cola example, they're not looking to leverage their, their tr trademark or their brand for, for um, uh, loan purposes or for uh, any kind of acquisitions. Um, there are professionals out there, and this is sort of a, a, a plug that I try to give to students sometimes. There, there are intellectual property jobs out there that don't require you to become a legal expert. Uh, you, you can get into trademark valuations, patent valuations, especially if you have a, a technical background working for companies that specialize in those kinds of things. Uh, I'm not sure if Kevin has seen uh, anything in particular, although he has some some family business experience you might be able to talk about as well. Well, I, I will just say uh, it, it kind of depends on the context. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, if you want to look at the, uh, at the, the pragmatic aspects, you know, a, any asset is worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what the context is. Are we talking about a fire sale? Are we talking about, you know, an actual, um, you know, a, a, a negotiated transaction. Um, but, but when I said, is there a CPA in the house, that was really kind of halfway joking. Um, most, I, I know a handful, if that many, uh, lawyers that, that intellectual property lawyers in general, I'm talking, uh, you know, whether it's trademark, whether it's copyright that, that get into some aspects of, of value, portfolio valuation. Uh, it is such a, specialized area that that by far most uh, most of us um, know what we don't know and and we uh, would much rather work with uh, an outside uh, firm with that uh, but uh, so so it's the, the short answer is you know we can't really tell you step one is this step two is that the with one exception the the biggest obstacle that I see or the I wouldn't say obstacle the the biggest um, uh, or I, I guess what, what people avoid is taking the time to accurately inventory what they have. Okay. It's, it's easy if you can, or it's easier if you can point and say, Hey, uh, you know, this is, you know, how much is the Coca-Cola, um, uh, 
composite mark work. Well, that's one mark. But businesses, unfortunately, they, they fail, and particularly smaller businesses, they, they fail to recognize what intellectual property they have, you know, beyond the business name, beyond, um, you know, the, the trademarks, beyond that. I mean, I, there is not a business that exists that doesn't, you know, own a lot of copyright assets, and they just don't realize that they do. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, where I get involved often is, okay, let's sit down and talk about, you know, your business. Well, do you use this in your business? Yes. Do you have it in writing? Yes. Well, congratulations. You've got the copyright. Maybe we can exploit that. Maybe we can, uh, maybe that's going to open itself up for, you know, another income stream. I, I know that's getting a bit of field, uh, from, from the question, but, um, uh, but the identification is, is kind of where Owen and I, you know, work on our end. And usually we bring in an outside, uh, you know, evaluator to help us on the, you know, on the financial end. And to put a bow on what Kevin said about a identification, 100% of all businesses have intellectual property. They simply fail to uh, identify what that is. It could be something as simple as trade name. More than likely, it's trade secret. If you have a, a customer list, you've at least got a trade secret. So everybody's got IP. It's just they fail to recognize it and sometimes fail to exploit it. Dr. Lincoln? Okay, I think we have time for one more question. All righty. Some small businesses might not be aware of how the public sees them in their brand. Someone once said, I don't know who developed water, but it probably wasn't fish. Uh, can you suggest a checklist to help a small business think of their identity? It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably any number of things that you could do and I'm, I'm akin to the last question. I'm not sure there's one definitive place to start, but something that kind of jumps off the top of my head and it, it kind of dovetails with a lot of where, especially the entrepreneurship program puts its emphases these days is thinking about it from a customer driven standpoint, design thinking, you know, is a, a slightly different label for that. Engaging with your customers and really understanding what it is, not only that they want, but what do they presently see from you? Uh, that could take the form of, you know, just sitting down face-to-face, uh, -face, <laughs> once that becomes a, a permissible thing again, sitting down face-to-face -face with uh, a handful of customers and understanding what, it, what attracted them to you to begin with. Uh, what is it they like visually? about uh, maybe a website and, and your brand identification, uh, things of, of that ilk. Uh, that, that would be at least my first inclination as a starting point. Um, Kevin, you got any thoughts on that? I'm gonna kind of go beyond the starting point and just say to kind of keep in mind, you know, the, the, the name of this very presentation, Static to Dynamic, and, and uh, understand that, uh, you know, consumer perceptions change over time. Um, and, and uh, that's something that you as a business owner have to understand. We didn't talk a whole lot about it, but we did talk a little bit about brand expansion. And that's something, you know, beyond just, beyond just the, um, um, the business, I guess, aspects of, of you know, choosing a, a mark and, and a brand portfolio that's suitable for expansion. You do have to think about, well, you know, uh, could a shift in social mores change down the road that would impact how people view our marks uh, and, and our, uh, you know, uh, just our, our kind of co corporate or per company persona. So, it, you know, it, unfortunately we don't have a crystal ball. Um, so it's, it's a, a difficult thing, but, but I think it's, it's in, for my, uh, you know, for my sake, I think you or in my mind, I think you have to kind of look at it, um, you know, through that, you know, that lens that, you know, this is not going, what we pick today is not necessarily going to work five, 10, 15 years from now. And, and that's why we try to emphasize also the flexibility, try to, try to be thinking long-term and, and related to the expansions that Kevin talked about. If you think about something like Nestle, as an example, Nestle is, is the last name of the um, fellow who um, founded the company and fast forward, you know, to today and you have brand expansions that build off the NES platform or uh, root of Nestle. So you have Nescafe, Nespresso, Nesquik, and a handful of others. Um, whether that was on purpose or sort of serendipitous, um, 
is probably a little bit irrelevant, but if at least you're thinking about that actively on the front end, maybe you can develop that unique brand that, that, that at the start gives you the flexibility to, to change and adapt over time and doesn't lock you into something very specific. The goodwill in that mark or in all those marks is in the NES. I mean, that's what people turn to. Okay, thank you. This wraps up our first HERD 2020 Insights Small Business Webinar. We want to announce our next webinar that will be in two weeks on July 13th. It's titled Drive, Engage, and Convert, How to Succeed with Your Digital Marketing Strategy. It will be presented by our faculty member, Tyson Ang, and a former student and now business professional, Casey Masri. Look for your registration email to arrive shortly. Please share the email invite with anyone you know who might benefit from these events. We appreciate your participation in today's webinar and always remember, we are Marshall.